Well, Kai, you put your finger right on the pulse. Right on the pulse. Uh, it is pretty obvious to the big copper producers, the people who control supply, that we have a supply cliff coming. Uh, we and they have underinvested in copper for three decades. Meanwhile, the global economy has grown. No matter what we do, absent a, sing uh, 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 sort of a synchronized global recession or depression, uh, we will experience much tighter copper supplies and probably much higher copper prices over the next five years. Will that occur in 2024? I don't know. Will it occur in 2025? I don't know. To be honest with you, Kai, I don't care. Uh, we have a circumstance where supply shortages are inevitable. The price doesn't have to go up in the early part of a supply shortage if you have a recession. If you reduce demand simultaneously with reducing supply, it doesn't necessarily have to have an impact on price. But the truth is that uh, I think uh, if we have a recession after the recession, uh, copper demand continues to increase for some fairly simple reasons. The world is electrifying. The way you generate electricity, the way you transport electricity, the, the way you utilize electricity is all about copper. And it's not just uh, electro electric vehicles and batteries. It's also about the fact that a billion people on Earth have no access to primary electricity. Over the next 20 years, they're going to get it. Uh, another 2 billion people on Earth have access to only intermittent or unaffordable electricity. And that's something uh, that the human race is going to address over the next 20 or 30 years. And that takes a ton of copper. Meanwhile, because we've underinvested in copper for 30 years, and because copper takes a lot of time and a lot of money to discover, and then permit, and then finance, and then build, there is an inescapable sense that over the next five years, we're going to have supply deficits in copper. Let's look at one deposit, the resolution deposit, a, a giant deposit in anybody's eyes. Uh, now, well over a billion tons of one and a half percent copper. To put that in context, that's three times the average mine grade worldwide. That deposit was discovered 30 years ago. It's been in permitting for 20 five years. There's probably another five years to go in permitting. Then after that, uh, there's probably five years to go in mine construction, which is to say a wonderfully located asset in Arizona, allegedly a politically safe jurisdiction. Wonderful, wonderful infrastructure. Towns nearby that have copper miners in them. Power, water, rail, road, everything perfect. 30 years in permitting. And this story goes on and on and on. There's also political challenges around copper, other political challenges. Cobre Panama, the Pan Pan uh, Panamanian government, stealing uh, a copper mine after a $10 billion uh, capital allocation to it. There is no doubt in my mind uh, that we will face supply shortages in copper. The other thing I like about copper is that it often uh, occurs in big mines. You've heard me say before, Kai, uh, small mines can make you small money. Big mines can make you big money. Small mines have big risks and big mines have big risks. I'd rather take big risks for big money. There's any number of copper mines in the world that generate well over a billion, a, a million dollars a day, pardon me, in free cash. When you make a big copper discovery, you get paid the way we got paid at NGEX. You get paid the way we got paid in Ivanhoe. You know, you get really, really, really paid. And in our business, you take big risks. Your big rewards have to amortize more numerous failures. And that's about copper. Uh, I think what you're saying is probably true. I, I need to say, Kai, that uh, your focus and the mining industry's focus is on the fairly short term, uh, what's going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, I used to be interested in that, uh, but I've noticed that my short-term price forecasting track record is unblemished by success. Uh, I've noticed, too, that my performance is just about average, which is to say the industry's track record is unblemished by success. Uh, I don't want to sound cynical, but what 
the copper price is telling me about the probability of recession in the next 12 to 18 months. I don't think the copper price knows. I don't think anybody knows. I don't think that uh, anybody can forecast uh, black swans, exogenous stocks, the shocks. I don't know if there's going to be uh, a recession. What I know is that I'm a fairly healthy 71 year old. Uh, and I'm going to be alive and investing and spending and saving on the backside of that recession. That I know for sure. Uh, I know that a billion people on earth have no access to primary electricity. I know that for sure. Do I know if copper is going to go to $5 or $3 first? Nope. Don't know. Don't care. I think two different reasons. Uh, your cost of capital is always lower in the gold business. Uh, people may pay more for gold-free cash flow than they do any other mineral commodities free cash flow. So your cost of capital is always lower. Uh, copper is very different. Uh, when you make a copper discovery, it is a great big and highly economic uh, deposit. If you look at the free, the free cash flow as a percentage of capital employed in the copper business and the gold business, all other things being equal, you'd never go into the gold business. Uh, the copper business is a better business measured by return on capital employed, measured by operating margin, pick a measurement. But the gold business has a low, has a lower cost of capital. It is not unusual uh, in a good market for senior gold miners to be trading at three times net present value. Trading at three times net present value uh, in an industry where your deposits are constantly declining means that your cost of equity capital is actually sub-zero. Uh, intelligent entrepreneurs like the idea that their cost of capital is actually sub-zero. <laughs> um, so I think that's the reason uh, for those two things. The fact that Ian Telfer may be down 75% on, on the helium business means I better start looking at helium. You know, <laughs> I like circumstances where the outlook as a consequence of its recent performance is so poor that the industry is in liquidation. So I guess that tells me I have to start looking at helium. Uh, I'm looking particularly at platinum and palladium, which is to say non-South African, non-Russian platinum palladium. There's not much to look for, but that's certainly a commodity that's absolutely hated. Um, the commodity that I think is really, really, really going to attract my attention in 2026 and 2027 will be lithium. Uh, you know, lithium was a, an investor's favorite. Uh, we never had a shortage of, ele of a, elemental lithium. We had a shortage of lithium refining capacity. The lithium price went up fivefold or sixfold. Everybody in the world started li looking for lithium. And lo and behold, we started looking for it. We found it. Now we have an oversupply of elemental lithium at the same time that we've de-bottlenecked the processing. Uh, there is no hate as sincere as the hate of a jilted lover. And there's probably half a million people who've lost fairly large sums of money on lithium. My suspicion is that you'll see a turnaround in that market, 2026, 2027. You'll see the rationalization of those discoveries which are economic uh, at lower prices. And you will see the type of investor hate around lithium that you saw around uranium and silver after they disappointed investors. That isn't a theme for 2024, but it's definitely a theme for 2026. So I'm beginning to spend a lot of money right now uh, understanding the higher quality undeveloped lithium deposits, where distress might develop, uh, and how uh, an old guy like myself may be able to take advantage of that circumstance.